This is Citadel Hill, and I know what you're thinking. This is just another classic colonial fort. After all, it's made up of barracks, bastions, and cannons. But you couldn't be more wrong. This is just the tip of the iceberg. In fact, over time, British forts were constructed across peninsular Halifax to meet the early settlement's ever-evolving threats. Today, this fort stands as a monument to Britain's enduring influence in the region, but this impressive structure often overshadows the reality that Halifax had a tumultuous early history right beneath our feet. Remains of some of the town's early defenses can be found today, but many are buried beneath sleek office towers or simply lost to time. Halifax's prolific early defense network a hint that perhaps early British control of the region was far more precarious than we'd been led to believe. So let's explore Halifax's early defenses, why the British thought they were so vital, and what remains of them today. The French would be the first Europeans to formally survey the Halifax Harbor as a potential control center, but the 1713 Treaty of Utrecht would ultimately surrender these lands to the British. But it would be decades, in fact 1749, before Halifax would be founded as a British outpost and capital within the region, under the now controversial Governor Edward Cornwallis. And this was the center of Halifax, built as the military parade square from the very beginning, but today it's a city park. The plan for this town also included a church, storehouses, combination prison and courthouse, and even gallows, supporting 2,500 settlers with room to grow. In fact, St. Paul's Anglican Church was that original church, built in 1750, and today it stands as Halifax's oldest building, which is incredible to think that this was here in the 1700s. So little remains of these structures, because they were mostly made of wood. Sounds like it was a great little town, right? But concern quickly turned to how they were going to protect this town, the settlers, and the position the British now held in the region, from land attacks, from the Mi'kmaq, Acadians, and the French. This threat, the culmination of the uncertainty surrounding the allegiance of the newly subjugated Acadians, descendants of early French settlers, and over a hundred years of close French Mi'kmaq ties in the region, the Mi'kmaq having lived in this area for thousands of years, deeply contesting British control. The answer to this problem was the construction of wooden fortifications right here. Fort George, in fact. It would be partially underneath today's citadel. And even then, at this early time, they knew the strategic value of building so high up on the hill. Of course, since these forts were made of wood, eventually left to decay or repurposed once they were deemed outdated, none are visible today. In fact, much of downtown Halifax rests where these forts once stood. The other half of Fort George stood right here, and it was really the center of a complex of fortifications that surrounded the entire original settlement of Halifax. And while it stood here, another fort stood right down there, and another over by that church steeple over there. So you can really tell that this town was well defended. The north side of Citadel Hill provides the perfect vantage point to see two of the other forts that were built at the same time period. There would have been one right down here, and another way off in the distance over there. So, if you're counting, that makes five stockade forts surrounding early Halifax. These all linked by a palisade wall made up of round wooden timbers 10 feet long and 6 inches wide. The forts themselves would have been about 200 by 200 feet with a bastion at each corner, a square center, and even barracks. But very soon, these five forts wouldn't be enough to protect Halifax. The town was expanding, and land-based attacks had become a very real danger. So, in 1751, where the isthmus narrowed, three small blockhouses linked by a patrol road were added to the town's infrastructure. Each wooden blockhouse was quite small, only about 12 feet square and 25 feet high, with musket holes and small cannon openings all around, and accommodations for 10 to 20 men. Surrounding these were triangular, 8-foot tall palisades. But only a few years later, around 1755, the danger of land incursions from the Acadians or Mi'kmaq had faded away. So the peninsular defenses, as well as the five original forts, were left to decay. This was the beginning of the Seven Years' War between Britain and France, 
And with that came the threat of French naval invasions. So Halifax's resources needed to be focused on their coastal defenses. Right away, three very powerful batteries were constructed along Halifax's harbor front. The North, Middle, and South batteries would have been all along this shoreline. And it's just incredible to imagine this in the 1750s because today the wharves have all brought the shoreline farther into the water, but they would have sat right here imposing on the waterfront. Just imagine fortified walls standing 12 feet above the high water line with seven foot high parapets facing the water. While they were made of logs, square timbers, earth, and sand, they were armed with 24 pounder cannons that can fire 800 yards into the harbor. And with the Seven Years' War beginning the following year, more would be added. With this evolving threat, construction of the well-known naval yards was key. And while the original Navy dockyards were constructed in the 1700s, look, today they're still in use. But this increased presence along the waterfront would not end here. These batteries and the defense they provided were supported by guns on George's Island. But this still wouldn't be enough. But it would have to evolve very quickly to be ready to defend British control of the region after St. John's Newfoundland was captured by the French in 1762. We're here in Halifax's beautiful Point Pleasant Park to explore two forts that were also built in 1762 in response to the French taking St. John's Newfoundland. Yes, okay, so this is Point Pleasant Battery. This was the very first fort built in this park, and that's why we're gonna explore it first. It was here when this area was just wooded, right outside of the city's limits. And it would be the first built with two defense structures. But much like the others, would go through many transformations, remaining in service throughout the War of 1812, the Napoleonic Wars, and the American Civil War eventually being significantly modernized during World War I to act as an anti-submarine defense for the harbor. But Halifax was still vulnerable. They needed more defenses to protect the harbor. So to understand that, we just have to go around the corner. Northwest Armed Battery was also built in 1762, but it wouldn't last quite so long, becoming out of date and falling into disuse by the mid-1800s. But during its life, it played an important role. The purpose of the Northwest Armed Battery, which is located right over here, was to prevent enemy ships from entering the arm and attacking Halifax from the west. It was aided by a Royal Navy sloop stationed right outside of it, as well as a chain boom that went right across the passage right here, which prevented enemy ships from entering. But from this construction until the 1790s, defense building in the immediate vicinity of Halifax slowed right down. Until... This is Fort Ogilvy, built just as Britain and France were again at war with each other in 1793, at the very onset of the French Revolutionary Wars. This fort was originally two-sided, outfitted with 24-pounder cannons mounted on platforms that allowed them to move faster and reach 1,200 yards. It was built high up, about 70 feet above sea level, overlooking Black Rock Beach, and it was in support of Point Pleasant Battery, defending the very entrance to the harbor. And Fort Ogilvy would be upgraded time and time again until the end of World War II, going through a vast transformation. In fact, it would remain the very last active fortification on Point Pleasant, ceasing operations in 1942. With this late end date and extensive use, very little evidence of this site's early fortifications can be found. But our next fort is very much not beneath the surface, so let's go take a look. The Prince of Wales Tower was built between 1796 and 1798, 30 years after Northwest Arm and Point Pleasant batteries were built. And what's so fascinating about this tower is that it was the very first Martello Tower built in Halifax. Some even say North America. As you can see, this is a two-story stone structure and it was positioned on the very highest point of Point Pleasant. And if you can imagine it, this was built to accommodate 200 men. Amazingly, the walls at the base are eight feet thick, tapering to a little over six at the very top. Extra sturdy to defend the Northwest Arm and Point Pleasant batteries, as well as Fort Ogilvy. 
It was designed with 35 musket holes on the bottom floor and eight on the second. And like all the other forts we've discussed, it would not remain frozen in time. Additional magazines and gun positions were added. The structure reinforced to make it more bomb-proof. A conical roof was added and more. But the tower's use as a defensive fortification would eventually come to an end in the last decades of the 19th century. And today, it stands as a national historic site. But at the same time as the Prince of Wales Tower was being constructed in 1796, a third fort atop Citadel Hill was also being built to dissuade the French. One that, much like the two before it, would never see battle, eventually falling to ruins, leading to the construction of the final fortifications on this site. Here we arrive in the 1800s with the Citadel's final iteration, the one we see today. It was built between 1828 and 1856. It took 28 years to complete this massive masonry fortress to repel attacks from the US. But by the 1860s, 1870s, with the dawn of modern ironclad steam-powered warships, this star-shaped fortification had already become obsolete. So this citadel's enduring presence ensures that we see Halifax through a lens of British supremacy. This fort, a symbol of British power. But the truth is, is that control of this area was much more precarious, with threats over a hundred years from land and sea, from the Acadians, the Mi'kmaq, and the French. And the forts we've explored have really illustrated this so well. So the truth is that Halifax as it stands today might appear to disguise its own history. In our case, one of a constantly evolving early city marked by conflict. That modernity and new technologies have buried an important story of a prized seat of control in colonial North America. But the truth is that this isn't a new story. These forts reminding us that this evolution has been happening since the day the British staked their claim. That Halifax as we see it today is only the most recent development. And that maybe it's not so far from this past as it may have seemed. Thanks for watching! If you'd like more history, check out our other videos, and don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell.